Where are you at with Winds of Winter? How's it coming? <laughs> Working on it! So we got Fire and Blood coming. Fire and Blood Volume 1. This is bullshit! You know what? This, this is bullshit. This is bull- Man, this is some bullshit! Boo this man! No! On the seventh day, a cloud of ravens burst from the towers of Dragonstone to bring Lord Aegon's word to the seven kingdoms of Westeros. To the seven kings they flew, to the citadel of Old Town, to lords both great and small. All carried the same message. From this day forth, there would be but one king in Westeros. Hallelujah! This is not history, this is propaganda. Hi everybody! So, per your request, after my first Far and Blood video last week, I'm posting a new video about the new book he has written. This time it's about the story of Aegon's conquest and how you shouldn't believe any part of it. Because the story of Aegon the Conqueror is clearly a piece of propaganda hatched by the shrewdest political campaign strategists in the realm. If this is the first God Academy video you're watching, hit subscribe, especially if you're into Fire and Blood because I'm gonna post a lot more videos about that book in the very recent future. Since this book is written as a proper history, written in medieval times, by a maester, we have to keep in mind that it was not written as a purely academic pursuit, but as an effort to advance an agenda. And this agenda is clearly a pro-Aegon agenda. So this agenda means this is clearly a pro-Aegon story. When we read this story, we should always keep that in mind. Aegon's story was written by the winners, by himself, the way that he wanted it to be and then it was passed down through the generations until this maester wrote it. It's fake news, fake news. So let's go through all the blatant propaganda in this story. Let's start with who was Aegon. Aegon is portrayed as the most critical person in Westerosi history, the founding father of the Seven Kingdoms. He's, uh, if you want, a combination of the U.S. Founding Fathers and Jesus. <laughs> because his conquest is the touchstone for the history of the realm. What came before Aegon? That's BC, that's old, ancient, and not working. And what happened after year one of the Aegon calendar is much better. Mm -hmm. The story about Aegon is meant to explain how we got where we are now. When the present changes, so does the story we tell ourselves about the past. Think about pretty much any event in your country's history and how people looked at it differently at different times because history always starts in the point of view of the present day historian. So this history is how Aegon the Conqueror united the realm through fire and blood. And he basically ignited the political process of unification that is not yet complete to this day. I elaborated on this angle and why this is a hint for the conclusion of the story in my first video about fire and blood. The link is in the description. So who was this Aegon fella? Mm, we don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> He's a mythical figure that, that might have been very different from how he is portrayed. Mm. But it's actually not important who he is. What's important is what he represents. He is nobody and everybody at the same time. If he had wanted for people to know what he was really like, then he would have told the maesters to write a different story about him. Hmm? But he left himself intentionally as an enigma. You can project into his mythical image whatever you're looking for. A warrior, a ruler, a collaborator, a strong-willed king. Hmm? He was nothing and everything, strong, yet didn't like to fight. He had the best dragon, yet he only used it when he had no choice. He was beloved by everyone, yet without close friends. A handsome man, yet faithful to his wives. He prayed to the seven gods, yet married his two sisters. He was harsh with traitors, yet open-handed with former foes. He was perfect, he had no flaws. He bowled 300 and he never took a dump and always had the best words. Ah, and Aegon, he was the only one who had the dragon stunning out. 
Mm. He's the special one, yes, and he had a vision of Westeros long before he came over on top of Beleriand the Dread. He had the painted table, Westeros with no borders, no seven kingdoms, one realm unified. So if you are a political strategist, if you're writing Aegon's story and you want him to be all that, you have one problem. He came from a different land, killed a bunch of people, burned a lot of castles, and then made everyone bow to him. That's not a good story. <laughs> That's not a good story. So this is why this story is full of justifications for the invasion of these foreign Valyrian lords. So step one is portray the previous situation as horrible. I'm not the problem. Westeros had seven kings. Now it has one. 24 rival houses vied for power and glory, it says. Ugh, people will die for glory in an endless, oft savage struggle for dominance. Ugh. So this is the problem that Aegon came in to solve. Mm, the savagery, yes, yes. There was hardly a time when two or three kingdoms were not at war with one another. Come on, who wants that, right? That's a very good reason for him to come. Yes, yes. Not only that, but Aegon also prevented something terrible from happening, the maesters tell us, because had Aegon not conquered the realm and burned down Harrenhal, Harren the Black would have gone back to pillaging from the Iron Islands. Whew. Thank the gods for Aegon and his dragon. Yes, yes, yes. And let's look at Aegon's capital. King's Landing, the new town, would be called. From there, Aegon the dragon would rule his realm, holding court from a great metal seat made from the metal twisted, beaten and broken blades of all his foes. A perilous seat that would soon be known throughout the world as the Iron Throne of Westeros. So King's Landing is like uh, Washington DC, hmm? not being part of any of the American states so as not to favor one. This is how you prevent all these quarrelsome lords to fight. You put above them an extraordinary, tremendous person who holds their petty ambitions in check. He is working for the good of the realm. And a definitive proof that Aegon was a solution and not a problem, is that there was never a united Westerosi front against him. Some locals were attacking his foes as the war was raging. So Aegon, he's just part of the Game of Thrones and just happened to be the best one at it. Step two, portray the previous administrations as horrible. Ah, uh, Aegon was actually antagonized into invading by two very bad people, Heron the Black, whose cruelty was legendary, and who wrote that legend? Hmm? And Argalic the Arrogant, uh, I don't think he called himself that, and he's actually not said who dubbed him the Arrogant, so it might as well be the historians from Aegon's time who tried to kiss the new king's ass, so he will allow them to publish <laughs> their history books, because if you wrote a pro-Argalic history book, hmm, it would probably not have made it to the bookstores. And it was the local Argalic the Arrogant who invited the Targaryens to come into Westeros. They weren't looking for that, right? But Argalic, he was doing that in an evil, sinister effort to use the Targaryens as a part of the endless Westerosi civil wars. Ugh. The Maester says that, that this sinister effort was plain to everybody. But there's no citations there. Plain to who, Mr. Maester? Hmm? How do we know that this is not fake news? While dealing with Argalic at the beginning, Aegon didn't even want to conquer everything with fire and blood. No, he came in peace, but Argalic, he was too arrogant to accept Aegon's offer for cooperation. It's his fault there was a war. Step three, Aegon is definitely, most definitely not a foreigner. He's not, no, really, really, no, 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 he's not, he's not. Exhibit A. When Aegon's knights unfurled his great silken battle standard with a red three-headed dragon breathing fire upon a, a black field, the lords took it for a sign that he was now truly one of them, a worthy king of Westeros. <sighs> Come on, 
He's not foreign because he has a flag. <laughs> okay, maybe that's not the best argument. Let's see if they have some better ones. Ah, ah, ah. Mm. This is as uh, everybody's cheering for him when he becomes king. The small folk, the fishermen, and field hands and good wives shouted loudest of all. He was loved by the people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, let's try another one. Let's try another one. Okay. He's not that foreign because his family has been living in Dragonstone for 200 years. And that's just off the Westerosi coast. Come on. And he also had some uh, local allies, the Valerians. Hmm? And he's been to Westeros before several times. So, you know, unlike uh, Daenerys Targaryen. Hmm? Also, the effort continues when they're describing the Tigers from Valantis, which was an army that invaded Westeros, as imperialists. Uh, so Aegon, he's not an imperialist, no. An imperialist is someone who conquers for coin and glory. No, Aegon came in to help. He liberated us. Come on. And Aegon, he's not this aloof foreigner guy who doesn't take into account Westerosi politics. No, no, no. He consulted his local Westerosi allies before deciding on the invasion. Mm. So this is a Westerosi affair. He's even more Westerosi than the other Westerosis because he looks at the realm as a whole. He's a pan-Westerosi, if you will. True, Aegon did go against Westerosi rules and traditions by marrying two wives. Mm. But he didn't make that shit up. No, no, he was bringing back some old Valyrian fashion, so he's uh, retro, right? Marrying your sisters is uh, disgusting, but let's not judge other cultures. Because Aegon, he does respect our laws and traditions. First of all, when he landed near the Blackwater Bay and claimed it, he didn't take it from anybody. No, no, because if he had taken it from some lord, that wouldn't be a good story to tell the other lords of the Seven Kingdoms that he came in and appropriated some land. No, no, no. The place was empty, I swear. There was nobody there. <laughs> And immediately when he went there, he claimed it and started building his new capital, right? Progress. He gave his name to, to the new buildings as well, because names matter in the stories a nation tells itself about itself. If you call something the War of Independence, it's different than if you name it the Rebellion. Hmm? And right after he landed, very quickly, it said, some local lords submitted to the awesome power of the dragon. In the end... Aegon's enemies had no answer for the dragons. So they lost fair and square in the Game of Thrones, which has always been part of Westeros. Okay, step four in the image of Aegon is Aegon the Divine. Before starting his conquests, Aegon made sure to also prey on it, right? To the seven, mind you. And the Lord told me to run for president. Yeah, I bet he did. He's going to have a fun night. He's going to be driving home election night going, yeah, we're going to see him. Yeah, great! Thanks for making me look like a fucking ass! <laughs> he was never a pious man. He's a man of action. But he prays to our gods. So he's one of us, right? And how does the conquest start? With a quote that I read at the beginning of the video with the blatant religious overtones, right? On the seventh day, a cloud of ravens burst from the towers of Dragonstone to bring Lord Aegon's word to the seven kingdoms of Westeros and all that shit. An old town is portrayed in the story of Aegon as the best place in the land. Maybe because the maesters who read the story, they're, they're from Old Town. Old Town was also the center of the faith. There dwelt the High Septon, father of the faithful, the voice of gods on earth, who commanded the obedience of millions of devout throughout the realm. Which reminded me of the question that was asked in defiance of the Pope. How many divisions does the Pope have? Then it continues. He commanded the obedience of millions of devout throughout the realm and the blades of the faith militant. Ah, okay, so he has actual divisions as well. Mm -hmm. So before crowning Aegon, the High Septon, the Pope, he consulted the gods during a very meaningful amount of time. Seven days and seven nights. Hmm? Not five days or something like that. No, 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 no. And he didn't eat or drink during that time because the story has to be awesome. And then it was the crone, the wise crone, who told him what to do. It wasn't a political move or a whim. He wasn't afraid. No, it was a heavenly decision. He's going to win. Romney will win.
the election. You believe that? I absolutely believe. What that. makes you believe that? Because the Lord told me. <laughs> well, that's why I'm glad to. I'm glad to know. And the High Septon, it is said, saved the city and the entire religion by accepting this foreigner who mocks their laws by marrying two women and his sisters, no less. And if we read between the lines, we see that the church had sway over the Lord of Old Town. Because one of his sons was in the faith militant and another was a septon. And of course it was the right decision, the story gives a clear answer. Thus, it was that no man from Old Town burned on the field of fire. When you read the story, you already know that Aegon <laughs> conquered everybody. So you're not gonna go, hey, why didn't my forebearers uh, fight against him? No, no, no. That was a good thing to do. Good move by the High Septon, definitely, definitely. And it was the High Septon who made Aegon a true king, which is how kingdoms during that time in history worked. The crown provides the church with privileges, monopoly on religion and with protection and the church provides the crown with divine justification for its rule thanks to its massive influence over the masses and the devout sadly this church and state alliance still lives to this day even in places where those are technically separate so it was in old town that aegon became king the home of the faith and his coronation there is the day that he decided is the first day of year one in Aegon's calendar. He could have chose the landing as a starting point, but that would have emphasized the foreign invasion by a man on a monster narrative that he probably wants to avoid. He could have picked one of his big victories, either the first one or the field of fire, and those would have highlighted his mighty force. But he didn't want to be Aegon the warrior. No, no, no. Starting with the coronation sends the right message, tells the story of unification under the accepted religious authority. And it was the church who officially awarded him with his titles. Aegon of House Targaryen, the first of his name, King of the Andals, the Roinar, and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, and Protector of the Realm. The job is done. He's part of Westerosi history. He's one of us and more worthy than us all. You have to live under some king. He's just better than the other guys. So stop your whining about the field of fire in your dead family. No, no. Tens of thousands cheered this new foreign king who just burned a whole lot of people. Thus were the seven kingdoms of Westeros hammered into one great realm by the will of Aegon the Conqueror and his sisters. Say Amen. What a beautiful story and obvious propaganda and probably sprinkled with a lot of fake news. Don't believe any of it. Don't believe any of it. Okay, so thank you everybody for watching. I'm gonna post another video about Aegon the Conqueror, about how he portrays his enemies and his allies. I'm gonna try to get to it by Tuesday. I'm gonna try. So hit like, watch this video about how Fire and Blood might give us clues about the conclusion of Game of Thrones Season 8. And I'll see you all next time. Bye everybody!